I'm going to be be short of rehearsing or, or revising some things that we have already shared together, but I want to revise because I want to emphasize and I want to give a, a greater clarity. I'm going to entitle my presentation this morning, The Big Picture. I am very much into the big picture. I'm very much into trying to get the big picture. I, I've learned that many times we get bits and pieces of ideas. But as I say all the time, we don't know how to put them together. We don't know how to how to utilize them or understand them in a cohesive way because everything is kind of scattered and ad hoc. And so I'm always very anxious that we should get the big picture. And so I want to focus on that this morning as we revise some things that we have already come to understand. But, uh, but hopefully, as we, we revise, we will also be gaining some deeper insights, hopefully, that will help us to be better able to relate to what we already understand. So I'm going to go ahead and share my Bible. And in, in speaking of the big picture, what I really want to look at is the thing that has been really absorbing my mind for the past few weeks, months. And it is it is the issue of the, the great background conflict that is taking place in the universe. To be very honest, brothers and sisters, I, I am very excited about this. The more we study together on this subject, the more I'm excited, the more, the more I feel like our lives are part of something magnificent and great, something that absorbs, something that involves the entire universe. You know, this is why sometimes you wonder what do people live for when they don't believe in God? I think I remember, I don't remember which one of them, but when he was nearing death when he was getting old and getting shaky and nearing death he said i look into the future and all i can see is darkness only darkness wow what a way to come to the end of your life all you can see is darkness but what else is there and i put it to you that one of the reasons why there is there there is increasing suicide and madness in the world is if you don't believe in God, what are you living for? What are you living for? To, to end up in darkness? What's the point? But my goodness, brothers and sisters, when we come to understand that there is a God and that we're a part of the greatest purpose in the universe, what a value that gives to your life. What motivation to live and to live for this God. What motivation to rise higher and to have a part to play in glorifying, in vindicating this great God. So I find myself more and more thrilled and focused as we look at this topic. And that's what I want to look at today, again, as we talk about the, 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 the big picture. And I want to start out by focusing on what I believe is the great goal or the great inward purpose or the great inward desire of every intelligent being in the universe you see god made us but god also made us with god made us good and god made us free and when you are free and you desire good things there are two things that i believe we value more than anything else the first of these is happiness and the second one is related to the first one the first one is happiness we all desire to be happy this is not something we might consciously desire it's built into us everybody wants to be happy and when you can't be happy, you go out and kill yourself. Sometimes you go out and kill somebody else. Or you do all kinds of crazy things. You go and you watch movies until you are, you are zoned out. You do some crazy things because you think these things will make you happy. But, but the, 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 the pursuit of life is really the pursuit of happiness. That's what everybody really wants. You quarrel with your wife. You, 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 you abuse your children. You quarrel with your neighbors because you want to be happy. And you think that they are making you unhappy or you think that they are getting in the way of your happiness. But everybody really wants 
to be happy. They just don't know how to be happy. Or they don't believe the way to be happy. The second thing that, are, that we are seeking for and that goes along with happiness is freedom. Everybody wants to be free. From the time that we are children, when I was, when I was, I don't know, maybe when I was about 13, 14, I started mumbling to my parents when they, I couldn't have my way. I'm just dying until I, 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 get, I get to be 18 or I get to be 21. I'm just dying to get out of this house. Because I, I felt like I was being restricted. The thing is, when you're a child, sometimes you are in the most perfect state because you don't mind being restricted. You don't mind being restrained because you are in a place where you believe that your restriction and your restraint is for your safety. My, my second son was very, very marked in this respect. He, when he, up, up to about age, age four or five, he would never let go of my hand. If we went walking in town, he would never let go of my hand. But one thing he would do, he'd still want to have his way. So he tried to drag me wherever he was going. He tried to drag me, but he wouldn't let go of my hand. He wanted to be free, but he wanted the safety as well. Because as children, you recognize that safety is related to having somebody who knows what they're doing, taking care of you. But everybody wants to be free. And by the time we get old and we think we know how to take care of ourselves, then we start trying to, 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 to get rid of restraint. We think that freedom means to have no restraint. What I'm saying is that ultimately what everybody is after is they want to be happy. Number one, we want to be happy. And along with that, we want to be free. I put it to you that these are the two great goals the two greatest goals of all intelligent beings. And maybe even, even those that are not so intelligent, like the animals, we call dumb animals. This is what they want too. They want to be happy and they want to be free. I would say that even insects want to be happy and they want to be free. Every living thing wants to be happy and it wants to be free. So these are the fundamental desires in the universe that, that need to be satisfied. Now. Why am I saying this? Because I want to point out to you that in the two, in the two great opposing systems that exist in the universe, there are two. There are not many. There's not Republican and Democrat. There's not JLP and PNP. There's not communism and, and, and democracy. There are two great principles. And it is good and evil. It is God. It is God's system of government versus Satan's system of government. Two, in this great conflict, these are the issues at stake. Which of these systems of government can give you these two things? Happiness combined with freedom, that is it. Which of these two systems of government can meet the great fundamental needs of created beings? Which of these two? If I sound a little silly in presenting this scenario, once you stop to think about it, you realize that it's not silly. It's factual. There is a Satan, there's a devil. If you don't believe in, in Satan, then I have nothing to give you. I have nothing to offer this morning. But you believe in Satan. You believe in Satan being in conflict with God. And you understand that this conflict is not a, a physical conflict because Satan has no chance in a physical conflict with God. It's an ideological conflict, and a conflict is a conflict where one party, the creature, professes to have a better system than God. This is the issue. And I'm going to show you in the Bible, I'm going to show you from the Bible where, where we see the principle of what Satan is after. The Bible may not... The Bible may not lay out the details the way I'm laying them out at the moment. But you will see the principles as we look at a couple of verses. Satan attacked three things. There are three things he attacks. And um, let me write them down and look at them quickly. Satan attacked God's character. Uh, give me a second. 
See the letter God's character. He attacked, he attacked God's principles of government. And thirdly, he attacked God's people. All right? So, I'm going to demonstrate that the Bible teaches us that he did attack these three things. It's important that we understand. Now, make a note of these three. God's character, God's principles of government, and God's people, and all of these are related to each other. But I've separated them into three things because you can look at the Bible and see a distinct attack upon each of these things individually. So let me go back to the Bible. First of all, let's look at where he attacked God's character. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, we see here something that we are all very familiar with. It's what Satan said to Eve in the garden. But look at it. It says, let's start with verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, you don't need to be too smart to see that. He's attacking God's character. When he says, you shall not surely die, the first thing he says is that God is not telling the truth. Attack on God's character. Second thing he says is that God knew. God knew from the beginning that when, when he told you not to eat, he was depriving you of something good. God knows that you will become like God, knowing good and evil. And yet God tells you that you will die if you eat the fruit. Because God is deceiving you. God, God is telling you something that is not true. Because he's trying to hold you back from something that will be beneficial to you. He is accusing God of being a liar, a deceiver, a conniving trickster. You can see clearly he's attacking God's character. He's trying to destroy confidence in God. And he did succeed because Adam and Eve accepted his lies. Well, at least Eve did. And Adam did in a secondary way. Here you see he attacks God's character. Secondly, he attacks God's method of government. In Job 1, in Job 1 verses 9 to 11, and, and these verses are in the Bible, but what I, I, I'm trying to do this morning, brothers and sisters, is take us beyond the superficial statements and try to understand what is behind what is happening. Why, why are these things being presented to us? What is Satan really saying? Look at what he says here now in Job 1, verses 9 to 11. Then Satan answered God and said, does Job fear God for naught? Let's understand the question. Is Job serving you for no reason at all? Look at what he says. Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. What is, what is Satan actually accusing God of? He's accusing Job, but he's, he, he's making a statement about Job, but he's not really interested in Job. He's interested in God. Satan is not really attacking Job. He's attacking God, but he's using Job as a way of attacking God. So when we look at what he's saying about God, about Job, we need to understand what is he saying about God? What he's saying is that God is using unfair means of gaining curry favor he's saying that god is using his, his superior power to induce job to be faithful to him in, in other words he's saying that god let me let me put it in my own words he's saying god you think that job serves you because he really loves you you think he serves you because your way is better than my way do you think that is why job is serving you no you know why Job is serving you? He's serving you for the same reason that Kenneth Copeland serves you, that Creflo Dollar serves you, the same reason that these people serve you, because they, they, they think that when they serve God, they get material advantage. You, God, have established a, a, a way of gaining subjects that is not fair. So he's really saying that if you gave Job if you left Job to himself, 
to examine your principles and my principles, Job would not serve you. It's not that your principles are better than my principles. It is because you have gained unfair advantage with Job by putting benefits into his life. And Satan says, I will prove it to you. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. I hope we're all understanding what I'm trying to say. I hope we're getting the point because this is not just a story in the Bible to entertain us. There are, there are principles here that we need, to, we need to understand. Satan is accusing God of using an unfair advantage. He's attacking God's character and he's also saying that nobody serves God because they think God's way is a better way. They are simply serving God because God, there's benefit in God. It's like my father. My father used to be a minister and he had all these little stories. But he told me about, you know, this lady who came to the church and um, she decided that she was going to be baptized. And the brethren, she, she was a, a poor lady, lived with her husband, poor lady. And the brethren got together like, you know, sometimes they are wont to do in the church. And they put together a little basket and they put a little money in there and they, they gave her to, to, to take home, you know. And um, this was before she even became a, a member of the church. And when she got home and the husband who was a, a, an ungodly reprobate, when he looked in the basket and he saw all this, these good things and the money. Well, in Jamaican parlance, he said, Jiny me, Jiny, profit in the Meaning, me, join it, me, join it. There's profit in it. And it was, you know, kind of an amusing story, but it, it, it expresses the reality of what Satan is saying here to God. He's saying that Job has joined himself to you and Job is serving you because there's profit in it. It's not because your way is better. So you see, what he's attacking here is God's government, God's system of government. First of all, he attacks God's character. And here in Job, you see that he's attacking God's government. And thirdly, what I don't have to prove to anybody is that he attacks God's people. In Revelation 10, in Revelation 12, verses 10 to 12, it says, the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. So Satan is an accuser of the brethren. But I want to point out something to you that I just said, and I want you to bear it in mind. When Satan attacks you and he attacks me, when he accuses you and he accuses me, what is he trying to do? He's really trying to put down God's system of government. You think Satan, Satan is concerned about you as an individual? Not so much. Not so much. He's concerned that if he can prove that you are a reprobate or he can prove that you're, you're, not, you're not faithful in what you are doing, he can attack God's system of government because God is governing in your life. And if you fail, it means that God's system fails. Do you see what I'm saying? When you go down to verse 12, it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he know it that he hath but a short time. So again, it points out that Satan is attacking God's people. So let me re repeat the three things. Satan is attacking God's character. And then he attacks God's system of government and it's related to attacking God's character. And then he attacks God's people, which is related to attacking God's government. So it's all one attack. But he goes about it from three different angles and his, his whole point, Satan is determined to establish that God's system of government is not fit to govern the universe. That is what he's after. Remember, that is what he's after. That's where he started from the beginning. He's, he's, he's trying to overthrow God's government by proving that it is faulty. It does not work. It does not produce true happiness and it does not produce freedom. 
That's the point. That's the big picture, brothers and sisters. That's what is going on in this universe. And your only question is, where do I fit into this scenario? Where does my message fit into this big picture? So I'm taking the time to, to, to look at this in, in some kind of detail because, you know, sometimes you come up with ideas and they are not balanced. They, are, they can't be supported. And I want to make sure that the things that I'm saying, you can see the reason behind it. You can see that it is, even if the Bible does not say it in so many words, the principles, the solid evidence is there once you try to understand what you're reading. Job said, God said that, Satan said that God bribed Job into being loyal. Satan says that the motive for, for serving God is always selfish. Satan says that God's way is not the way of true freedom. Now, I want to read some quotes something that I, I, I'm almost reluctant to read, but I'm going to read it anyway. The, these things are so blasphemous that I almost don't want to put it where anybody can see. But since we are, we are, we are they're on the internet, they're all on the internet. I'm going to put some statements here on the screen and they are taken from the principles of the church of Satan, all right? Because what I want to point out to you is that what I'm trying to say, uh, what I'm trying to say was Satan's Satan's principle. It remains. He has not changed. Now, in the Church of Satan, on the Church of Satan, the First Church of Satan, there are principles that they refer to as the, the Ten Commandments. I think they have been expanded to, to 11 now. But I think this is number, number six and number seven. Look at what he says. This is what the, 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 the high priest of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey was his name. I think he's dead now. But, but number six says, before none of your printed idols do I bow in acquiescence. In other words, I don't, I don't, I don't obey any of your printed idols. When he says printed idols, he means God's commandments. And he who said, thou shalt, thou shalt to me is my mortal foe. All right. I'm going to come back to it and comment on it. The next commandment says, I dip my forefinger in the watery blood of your impotent mad redeemer. He's referring to, to our Lord and Savior Jesus. And I write over his thorn-torn brow, the true prince of evil, the king of slaves. Now, if you look at the, these two uh, statements, there are two things that jump out at you. It says, a person who says, thou shalt to me, is my enemy, is my mortal foe. If you tell me, thou shalt. <laughs> And he said, the true prince of evil is Jesus. He is the king of slaves. And why is he the king of slaves? Because he has said, thou shalt. In other words, what Satan is trying to promote here through his church is the idea that true freedom means to be free from God's restraint, to be free from God telling you what you must do. This is what freedom means. And the one who tells you, the God who tells you how to behave is the true prince of evil because he has enslaved you by restraining your behavior. Now, this is just, I, I, I've just added this to, to the, the, the evidence we have seen from the Bible. I've just added this because I want to emphasize the point that Satan, the principle of Satan's government, he's, he's claiming to seek freedom. He's claiming to be a freedom fighter. And what he's looking for freedom from is freedom from God. He's looking for freedom from God's principles. And um, it comes out very clearly in the statements made by the church of Satan. The one who says, thou shalt is my enemy. And the true prince of evil, the king of the slaves, 
is Jesus Christ. We are slaves because we submit to God. We are slaves because God controls our lives. This is Satan's accusation expressed here in the church of Satan. And we can see it coming out in the other incidents we looked at from the Bible where Satan is trying to promote the idea that serving God is a kind of slavery that is only indulged in because we are we are looking for benefits. We are looking for benefits. It's not because God's way is better. We have chosen to be submissive because there is benefit. God is, is protecting and surrounding us. Now, you, you can understand why the only way God could have proven that Satan was a liar was that he had to let Job suffer the way he did it. All the benefits had to be taken away from Job. His children, his money, his house, even the comfort of his wife, everything was taken away. And Job demonstrated to Satan and to the universe that he served God not because of the benefit, but because he was convinced that God was good. What he knew of God made him know that God is good. And we can understand why God's people too are permitted to go through this kind of trauma time after time after time. If this is a real, if, if this is one of the big questions, now you can understand why sometimes we're allowed to bring, we're allowed to pass through these traumatic experiences because it says in Revelation 12 and verse, might have been verse 12, it says, they, they, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Mark that point. God's people are able to overcome Satan because one of the things they do, they don't love their lives to the death. They prove to the universe and to Satan that their love for God is greater than death. Take away everything from me. Take away my life even. And God is still good and I will still serve him. What Satan is after, really? What Satan is after, really, brothers and sisters, is not freedom. What he's after is freedom from God. That's what he's after, freedom from God. <laughs> when, when you look at where Satan's method of freedom has taken us, I wanted you to look at something. This morning, Daniel was talking about how the craziness of modern, the modern educational system Maybe not just the modern one, the ancient one was just as bad. But the popular education systems, he was looking at how this leads us to crazy conclusions, crazy behaviors. There's no, there's no male and no female. There, 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 there's no, there are a hundred different genders, all the lunacy. There's no God, all the craziness. That is the kind of freedom that Satan is after. Or that is where his, I'm sure when he, he rebelled in heaven originally, that was not his, he had no idea where he was going. He didn't know. But when you, when you, when you tell persons that there's no God, you set them free from God. History, the history of humanity is showing you that when you, when you become free from God, the only part we are left is complete lunacy. I'm not exaggerating this. I'm not overstating the case. Everybody can see when you divorce yourself from, from God, all that is left is madness. Men think they can become women. Women think they can become men. Men getting married to men. And behind it all, behind it all, in the midst of this stated freedom, do you see what is happening? The, 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 the institutions established by Satan's principle of government are taking away your freedom step by step by step. You are free as a man to become a woman, but you are not free to call a man a man. If he says he's a woman, you can end up in jail. You're not free to write a trap talking against this kind of madness. You might end up fined and might even end up in prison. You're not free to stand on the road and read from the Bible. If you mention the, the word homosexual, you can end up in prison. So you are free from God. You are free from God's principles, but you become free by an encroaching bondage to the systems that Satan chooses. It's a, it's a, it's a mirage of freedom. It means freedom to indulge carnality, 
It does not mean freedom from control at all, at all. It's a different system of government, which makes you free to your, which makes you free to indulge your carnal nature, but you are in bondage to other men. That's the kind of freedom Satan is promoting right now upon the earth, brothers and sisters, is being demonstrated to the universe where Satan's government, where Satan's system of freedom takes us. And I pointed out, was it last week? But I, I'm going to rehearse what, what we said at that time. There is no way to escape it. Look, if you put 10 of us in a room and we're not Christians and we're not committed Christians even, because it happens with Christians. I know Christians come together and they say they're going to live together on one property and they stay together for about three years before there is mayhem and confusion and they all find themselves, they have to leave because human nature takes over and they can't live together in peace. It's a sad, sad thing, but it's the truth. Because carnal Christians will end up the same place as those who are not Christians at all. Can't live in peace because everybody's after his own benefit. And we don't think of others, we think of ourselves. But what we have seen is that once you put carnal people in any space, you better make laws, otherwise they will kill themselves. A little boy comes to school with a gun deliberately plans and premeditates, pulls out the gun in the middle of the class and shoots his teacher, six years old. Evil from the womb. That's what carnality is, evil from the womb. How do you control it? How do you put evil people to live together in the same space? You take away their freedom because freedom in carnality is, 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 is a... Is a it's a guarantee of mayhem. Now, did Satan know all of this at the beginning? I doubt it. The poor creature who cannot see the, the end from the beginning rises up against his creator and says, I have a better way. We need to be free from restraint. We are, we are smart enough to, 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 to determine which way to go. Smart enough to be Einstein, smart enough to be Stephen Hawking, and not smart enough to know that you didn't come from nothing. The, the, the blind one-sidedness of Satan's kind of, kind of wisdom was that he rose up against his creator. He could not see the end from the beginning. He could not see the future. He had no idea of the madness that he would eventually get created beings into. It's being played out on planet Earth. Planet Earth is a, is, is a theater of the universe. I, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't be distressed. When you, I mean, sometimes I listen to 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 presentations on YouTube, huh? Christians in America, and they are bemoaning the fact that America is is going down, and and the spirit of God is leaving. Yeah, okay, it's it's it's, it's your country, but look here. There, there's no escape. There's no way. Embrace that the 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 the, the principles of life are being played out in this planet. There's no way to escape. The problem is that they think that the enemy is Russia or they think that the enemy is China. No, the enemy is human nature. Do you think Americans are better than Russians or Chinese? Do you think so? Do you think the principle of government in America is going to, is going to deliver anybody any more than the, the principles in Russia or China? Nothing can deliver humanity but the principles of the government of Jesus Christ, the principles of the government of, of the God of heaven, that is the only government that can bring freedom and happiness. All that America is demonstrating is that demo democracy leads to tyranny, just like communism. Give it enough time. There's no escape from it. Because it is still the same. Democracy is simply saying, democracy in carnality is saying, give a set of carnal people the, the, the right to, to, to make the decision for the rest of us carnal people. Where do you think it's going to go? When carnal people start shooting each other, they make laws to take away the guns. You can cry all you want. When carnal people, if they decide to cut down the population of the world because they're getting too big, they, 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 they genetically modify the food because they have the authority to do it, are they, are, they, are they genetically put stuff into your body? What are you going to do about it? It's a democracy and a majority rules. 
uh, 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 Sister Karina was telling us a few nights ago that the same government that locked down Australia and that had them under those draconian rules, they had a, a, an election recently. They put back the same government in power. They put back the same government in power. All of us here are, are complaining and grumbling and we say the world is waking up. No, 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 no. The world is not waking up. They embrace their bondage. They embrace their tyranny because it is the way of, of Satan's principle of government. Men give men control and they submit to whatever they say because they think it is a safer way. It's a better way. It's inevitable. There's no way to escape from it. So as we said last week, when the mark of the beast comes finally, the majority of the world will embrace it with open arms because they will say it is for our common good. There's no way to get away from it. In, in a carnal, in, in, the, in the government of carnal people, the mark of the beast is the inevitable place that the world finally reaches. There's no way to escape. Those who are truly free will be those who will stand up for, for, for the Lord God. Free because they are, not, they are not governed by the principles of this world. They are governed by the principles of God's kingdom. And so this kind of freedom cannot be tolerated in Satan's system of bondage freedom. In Satan's system of freedom bondage, this kind of freedom cannot be tolerated. And so they will be wiped out or the, the attempt will be made to wipe them out. It's not strange. It's not unusual. It's the inevitable result of government of carnal people. It has just taken 6,000 years for it to come to maturity. What we see is that Satan is not, is not objecting to government by rules because his, his system is full of rules. rules. He, he objects to government by God. He's against, uh, he's against principles that, that govern your, your, your carnal desires. He's not against rules that limit you, your behavior, and put you under the control of other people. What we see is that when, when, when you are dealing with carnality, okay, Satan, Satan established a system that we call a system of carnality. And what do I mean? When Satan took away half of the universe from the government of God, what he did was he, he made half of the universe into carnal beings because carnality is simply the absence of the spirit of God. It's simply you, the creature, without God. That's what it means to be carnal. Carnal doesn't mean that you are, you're, you're a molester or you're a rapist. Maybe that's how we use the word in, in, in our context. But in the biblical context, Carnal simply means of the flesh. It simply means you don't have the spirit of God in you. So Satan introduced a system of carnal government. You have a set of carnal people. How do you control them? Because you have eliminated the spirit of God. You have to set up a system of government of external control. And I'm going to tell you, when you are dealing with carnal people, there is no other option or else you leave them to destroy themselves and to destroy everybody else. And that is why it says in 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. The law is, the law, law, external law is not made for righteous people. It's not made for people who are in the spirit. It's made for the lawless and disobedient. It's made for carnal people, for the ungodly for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers. It's made for people who are under Satan's system of government. They need law. And even God, even God put carnal people under the law. It says in Galatians 4 verses 3 and 5, 3 to 5. It says, even so, we, even we, we Christians, we the people of God. When we were children, when the people of God were children, when, when God's people were, were, were the Hebrews, the Israelites, the, 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 the body of God's people were in a state of infancy. They were not mature. We were in bondage. That's the word. We were in bondage, as I said, 
the law, the system of legal law is not a system of freedom. It's a system of bondage. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. God controlled people by putting them under external forces to keep them in check, to keep their, their desires and their lust and their carnality under control. But when the fullness of the time was come, the time appointed by the Father, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law. Jesus came under that same system of subjection to the law. Why? To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. No more servants, no more under bondage. Free people, free beings, now under God's system of government. But the point I'm making is that even God, even those who were called God's people, in a state of carnality, the Bible refers to that as a time when we were children, spiritual children, in that state of carnality, the only option was that even God had to use external law. God put them under the law. And if you look at the previous chapter, everybody knows it. I'm just reminding you of what you know already. In verse 19, chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serve at the law? What's the purpose of the law? It was added, it was added to God's plan of salvation. Because of transgressions, because of carnality, God put them under the law. God gave the law because he was dealing with carnal people, people who were transgressing constantly. And he put them there till the seed should come. It was a temporary measure until the true system of God's true government arrived. Jesus brought God's true government. And that is why it says, when you go down to um, Romans chapter 8, this is what we are told. These are those who have, who, have, who, have, who have come to God's government. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the government of God. Has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, the written law, the external law, the, 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 the law given on Sinai, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, it was weak because it was dealing with carnality. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. There we see brothers and sisters, the two systems of government. The system of government that is based on external control and the system of government that is based on the spirit of God Amen. inside of the believer. Two systems. Which one works? That is the question before the universe. Now, when God gave the rules, you know, he gave the best rules. In Deuteronomy 4 and verse 8, it says, look at what Moses says. You know, Moses never understood what we understand today, but this is what Moses could say about what God gave them on Mount Sinai. He says, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 8, what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? What am I saying? I am saying that according to the Bible here, these were the best laws that were ever given to humanity. And what does Paul say? The law could not do what God wanted. The law could not. You don't, we don't need a better law. I've heard it said that Buddhism embraces principles very similar to the Ten Commandments. So does Islam. Your laws could be ever so beautiful. Somebody says, we are no longer under the Ten Commandments. We are under the law that says, Love your neighbor as yourself. Look here. Love your neighbor as yourself is harder than thou shalt not kill. A man smites you on the cheek and you turn the other cheek. It's harder. The, the, the commandment to love on the outside is worse than the Ten Commandments in the sense that you can't keep it any better. It's worse. 
One gentleman said to me one time, one, one of these theologians, he said, the, the greatest, the greatest exponent, ex, ex, expounding of the gospel was the Sermon on the Mount. And thank God, I without my, my any theological credentials, I said to him, I don't agree with you. And he was astounded. He says, there's no, there's no better expression of the gospel. I said, what is the gospel? The gospel is not what you must do. The gospel is what God has done for you. Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, there are statements made by Jesus, and they are beautiful statements, but they don't tell you how to live this way. It says, if a man smites you on one cheek, turn the other side. It says, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you have already committed adultery. What is the answer to these problems? Jesus gave us a picture of the perfect kingdom. Beautiful. But he didn't tell us how to get there. It's later on, he told us, later on in the Bible, but not in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is harder than the Ten Commandments. As beautiful as it is for carnal people, it is, it is, it is a, a, a step into futility and hopelessness. Because external law, no matter how beautiful, can never fulfill those two goals, freedom and happiness. And so even among Christians, they still have to set laws. They still have to have church, church board meeting. They still have to have counseling with Christians because they can't get along with each other. They're in the same church and they're not talking to each other. And the slightest thing one person says that one has harbors malice or they fly off the handle because it's not the beauty. It's not the beauty of the rule. You tell, you tell Christians love one another. You tell them forgive your enemies. And they are still there keeping malice. Because the problem is the rules are on the outside. The system of government from the outside does not work. And 6,000 years of human history have, has proven it. And it will finally culminate in the mark of the beast crisis to show you where, where external government ends up in its perfect state. That's why I'm so loving Revelation, because you can see where internal government, the, the law of the spirit of life, where does it finally take us? Look at Revelation. Look at the one forty four thousand. You'll see where God's system of government finally appears before the universe in the full display of its beauty. And it will be settled forever. God is getting us there, brothers and sisters. That system of external government never worked. It only produced bondage. And as a matter of fact, when God gave it, one of the purposes why God gave it was, yes, to control carnal people, but also to prove that it doesn't work. He was, he was, he was demonstrating that Satan's principle of government does not work. That's a part of what he was doing. And that is why, look at what the Bible said. What does the law do? What does the law do? Because the law worketh wrath. The law creates wrath or it creates condemnation. The law creates condemnation. For where no law is, there is no transgression. If there is no law, there is nothing to condemn anybody about. One purpose of the system of law is to condemn people. Romans 5 and verse 20 says, Moreover, the law entered. God gave the law. God brought the law into the picture that the offense might abound that the condemnation that was resting upon humanity might become greater. God gave the law to demonstrate that law can never produce righteousness. So these were the problems, accusations against God's character, accusations against God's system of government, accusations against God's people. Now look at what happened. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God came to this planet, the greatest answer to Satan's accusations. He arrived on this planet. Here's what he did. First of all, John 17 and verse 4. Here's what he did. I have glorified thee on the earth. Hallelujah. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus answered the, the accusations against God's character. Nobody looking at Jesus can ever again think that God is unfair, unreasonable, unkind. And not good. It's all there. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, it says, 
God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to do what? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God answered the accusations of Satan. When Satan accused God of being unfair, of being unjust, of having, of, of having unworthy motives. God in the person of his son came down to this planet as a man and put his character on display. In all his, in all his he became vulnerable. He became killable, if I can coin a word. He became temptable. And in this human nature, his goodness was displayed in all his glory. And he answered the accusations against his character. That has been settled. The second thing he did goes along with that. He unmasked the devil. As he was about to go to the cross, here's what Jesus says. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Okay? The accusations that Satan brought against God in heaven were being answered by Jesus. When he killed the Son of God, it marked... I'm getting some feedback. It marked the moment when he was going to be thrown out of heaven. So... The, the, these two things, these two things, Jesus put God's character on display so we could never again be mistaken about it. Secondly, he unmasked Satan. So Satan's lies about God's character and Satan's motives, everybody came to understand it. And the third thing that he did, the third thing that he did, I, and, and, and I, I, I maybe should write these down, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... A little bit strapped for time. I want to finish my thoughts. The third thing that he did was that he redeemed humanity. Let me re repeat those three things, three things. Number one, he revealed the true character of God. Number two, he revealed the true character of Satan. Number three, he redeemed humanity. Three things already done, finished, accomplished. Romans 5 and verse 10 says, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Hallelujah. That is finished past tense. Independent of you. Whether you accept it or not, it is true. God reconciled us to himself through the death of his son. Every human being on this planet, there are no barriers between you and God anymore. And if somebody says, well, what about my sins? And here's what. The same God says, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. We just saw that. He repeats it. But look what he says next. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Goodness gracious. Every time I read it, I'm still blown away. I still say it's one of the most outrageous verses in the Bible. You mean the sins of the world are not charged to the world? Either Paul was a madman. Oh, this is one of the most amazing verses in the Bible. Christians and, 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 and sinners alike like to dwell upon their sins and to plead for forgiveness for their sins. The Bible says here is this extraordinary, uh, extraordinary verse that says, when God redeemed us, reconciled us to himself, he did not charge our sins to us. He took them out of the way. The sins of the world. He doesn't mean those who have accepted Christ. He means the whole world. But as we can see, as we go back to that verse in Romans that we just looked at, it says we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. But it's not finished. It says much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There are people who are reconciled who will be lost because they never accepted the life of Jesus Christ. Reconciled to God, no barriers between you and God, but you refuse to accept the life that makes you into the new creation. How can you, being reconciled, how can you be saved? Because salvation means to be changed from the old creature to the new creature, but there are no barriers. God has nothing against you. God has nothing. There are no record of sins standing in your face. God 
took them out of the way through Jesus Christ, all of them right up to the end of time. But you need to receive his gift of life. Or you can't be saved. So God redeemed man. Three things. Jesus revealed the character of God. Jesus revealed the character of Satan. And Jesus saved humanity. Wow. All of this done 2,000 years ago at Calvary. When Jesus said it was finished. Salvation of humanity was finished. The revelation of God was over. The condemnation of Satan was finished. It's finished. In Isaiah 54 and verse 17. This is what we see now. Isaiah is the gospel prophet. And this is what Isaiah said. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in the judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Why? Their righteousness is of me, said Jehovah, said Yahweh. This is where Jesus has brought us. And the thing is, brothers and sisters, what I just said to you, 90% of the Christian world believes it and they understand it. And the problem is that 90% of the Christian world, 95% of the Christian world, maybe more, they stop right there. It was finished at Calvary. It is done. They don't yet understand the issues in the big picture. That's the problem. That is the element of truth that I believe we need to bring to the forefront. We need to continue to emphasize it, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of those that are Christians who don't understand. There is still something that is left. It is unfinished work. That's why we are still here. It is unfinished work. And, and most Christians believe it was done at Calvary. Done and finished, nothing more. We're here for 2,000 years. What? Marking time, twiddling our thumbs. What is going on? There's still something that is left. And as we have been discovering, the book of Revelation unveils this and shows us what is going on. There's still something important left. What is left? Remember, he accused God's character. What else did he attack? He attacked God's system of government. That is still unfinished business. Does God's system of government work? And let me just highlight here what I said a little earlier on. I'm going to repeat it. God's system of government is expressed in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. Look at what God says I'm going to do. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you. I will cause you. I will do it. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my minds and do them. Now it's interesting. God says, I will cause you. I will be the reason why you keep walk in my statutes and keep my judgment. This is God's government. It's yeah. God on the inside of his people. A, a new spirit I put within you. As Paul, says, as Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, what? I live yet what? Not I, but Christ liveth in me. This is God's system of government. It's the only system of government in the universe that works. It produces happiness. It produces freedom. And yet it produces harmony among people. Because when Christ lives in you, the hand does not fight the other hand. The hand does not fight the foot. The ear does not complain against the nose or the eye. It's the only system that takes away selfishness and makes people truly fit to live together in joy and peace and happiness. External government can never work. This is a system of government that God had in the beginning that Satan complained against because it put God too much in control of our lives. It is a system of government that is called righteousness by faith. It is called Christ, our righteousness. It is our message. It is the last message. And it is the only message that can set the world free. This is why the book of Revelation is about the two governments. It's about the display of the government of Christ in you versus the government of laws on the outside. 
the two yeah. systems of government face to face on the planet in the final great confrontation with the universe looking on. We are in it, brothers and sisters. We are in it. It, it ought to fire our, our imaginations. It ought to stir up our hearts and change our lives that we become the best people that we can possibly be under the inspiration and the motivation of the Spirit of God. This is what is going on. And I tell you, when I understand this, look, once in my life, I wanted to be good because the rules said so. I wanted to be good because it was expected of me. Oh my goodness. Something better has taken me over. I want to be good for my father. I want to be good. I want to live for him. Look, I want even the food I eat. I want that when I sit at the table, I sit with God. I want him to govern my life because the universe is watching and they want to see how does God's system of government produce the best? What can we see when Christ lives in a person? What can we see? The destiny of the universe hangs upon the answer to this question. It is not over, brothers and sisters. And thanks be to God, you and I are in the heart of this conflict. Thanks be to God, he has brought us to this moment in time. And I think I could say that all the, all the prophets and the apostles wanted to see a time such as this. We should not be like those who are mourning and bemoaning and bewailing the fact that we are, there's so much confusion and so much, so much negativity happening in the world. We were born for such a time as this. We were born for this. We were, we were redeemed for this. We have a part to play. It's a privilege. It's not a trial or a burden. All I can say is God help us to take the, 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 the position that we should take, to stand like the brave with our face to the foe and to let the world and the universe and Satan see that the system of our God was and is and always will be the only thing that can work in this universe. So I, I, I want to stop here with a hope that we can see the bigger picture and seeing the bigger picture, we know exactly where we fit in and we know exactly why if we come short of his glory, we are not lost. Of course, we are not lost. We were saved 2,000 years ago. We accepted Christ. But oh my goodness, we live for more than simply to save ourselves. We live for more than this. We, we, we are a part of, our, of the body of our Savior. We are a part of God's business. I am in this battle for the honor and glory of my Father, not to save myself. Thank God we have risen above that. So God bless you, beloved, and thank you for your attentiveness this morning. May God apply these words to our hearts with the power that they deserve to be applied with.